Education is not filling a barrel, but lighting a flame. And we all know this is true. We know this is true because all of you remember one teacher. You remember that teacher not because they made you understand that A squared plus B squared is C squared, although it's important. You remember that particular person because they were able to connect with you in a very unique way. They were able to touch you. And this quote was true back then, and it's even more true nowadays. In an age of information overload, we don't need more barrel filling. We need to spark curiosity. And in my daily work as a teacher, I try to uh, spark this curiosity in my students by bringing very abstract knowledge back to their daily life. So to give you a little bit of taste, imagine for a while that you are my students. It's Tuesday morning, you are in probability and statistics class. So instead of talking about probability distribution using the classical example of the, the, the bag with the marbles, I would use Tinder. And Tinder is an excellent way to explain probability distributions. Why? If you know a little bit about Tinder, you will start swiping left and right, and at each swipe there is a chance to have a match. And that's a classical example of a binomial distribution. If you have a match, you will start exchanging messages with a person, and there is a probability of receiving a certain number of messages in a certain period of time. And that's a classical example of a Poisson distribution. After a while, you will start dating and so on, and the period people tend to date before deciding this is an official relationship is more or less a normal distribution. So by taking very abstract knowledge and bringing it down to the daily life of my students, I know for sure that next time when they take the phone and click on Tinder, they will think about the Poisson distribution. You are still in my class, and it's <laughs> Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday afternoon, we will do programming, and a classical way to teach students programming is to give them the challenge of approximating the number of pi. It's a way to learn about writing code and thinking logically and so on. And instead of giving my students this challenge, I challenge them to make their house hunting in Amsterdam very efficient. After all, if you manage to find the love of your life through Tinder, you, find, you better find a house. So I give them the task of, well, instead of going through many websites yourself, try to write a piece of code that does it automatically for you. It takes information from a lot of websites, structure it for you, and it does that in a matter of a second instead of, a matter, instead of hours if you do it yourself. And all this would happen in a classroom that doesn't look like this. This is very depressing. So at the start of uh, the class, I ask students to move the furniture around. Don't do it right now. Stay where you are. And it seems very chaotic, but at the same time, there is a lot happening there. I think that learning happens when ideas are exchanged, not between, uh, only between the, the students and the teacher, but also between the students themselves. So it's a nice way of, of educating the, the future generation, but it takes a lot of time to uh, develop such education. And the biggest problem I have as a teacher is that, that I don't have time. It's a big challenge. And the majority of my time goes to lecturing, uh, preparing for lectures, preparing for exams, grading exams, meeting administrations. And there is a little bit of time left for the very reason I chose to work in education, which is inspiring the younger generation. And there is also a little time left for me as a teacher to keep myself inspired. In my first year, when I, was, when I started teaching, I kept track of how much time I spend on each task, and I came to the conclusion that I have approximately 5% of my time to spend on learning and inspiring myself. 5%. 5% of my time to inspire myself in order to be able to inspire other students. So from the first days when I was teaching, I asked myself, what can I do within my limited capabilities in order to make that portion of my job, which makes my job so interesting, how do I make it as large as possible? And of course, the, the logical place to start is making videos. Instead of giving lectures, we record videos, you do it once, you make them available online, and students can watch them and can prepare to the lecture. 
It was a good start, but it's not enough. And I think we secretly all know what happens when you give a bunch of videos to students. When I was looking at the viewing uh, numbers, how many videos one was, were watched and when, I saw this. And I think you can see where the exams are. <laughs> right? So I was thinking about this, and I, try, I was trying to think beyond the uh, uh, blaming the students and saying, oh, they are lazy, and that's why they are not watching the videos. I was trying to think very critically on the way our education is structured. And I came to the conclusion that actually what I was doing is the same one-size-fits-all approach, except it was on YouTube and not in the lecture room. There isn't any diversity to meet the diverse needs of students in this approach. Everybody goes through the same tunnel, and if you get stuck, you get stuck. There isn't any other way. So I was thinking about this, and I came to the idea that in order to make this a little bit more flexible, we need two things. First, we need very small knowledge components, very small knowledge components that are the building blocks of a subject, and also relationships between all these knowledge components. So, what are the knowledge components do you need in order to master something new? And if you mastered something, what can you do next? And to give you an idea, I want to show you a picture. This is um, how such a network, it's called a knowledge graph, would look like for a very specific part uh, from the physics curriculum. And what you immediately see, instead of having one tunnel or one path, it creates a diversity of paths. So everybody can, can follow their own path, depending on their needs. And what you see here, the, the nodes are the individual knowledge components, and the arrows are the relationships between them. It was a good start to structure knowledge in, the, in this way, but it was not enough. And it was not enough because this knowledge graph is overwhelming. What I just showed you is a very specific part from high school physics. Imagine if you would make the same learning graph for the entire physics curriculum. It would be overwhelming. It would be a nice tool for teachers to discuss what is it that we should include in the curriculum or not. But for students, in order to personalize their education, it is overwhelming. So somehow they need guidance. They need a navigation system, so to speak. How do they navigate their way through this overwhelming uh, network of knowledge? Of course, you can do it as a teacher. You can, at each node, indicate whether the students should go left or right. But it is more efficient to do it using an algorithm. And this is where artificial intelligence comes in. We have enough algorithms and artificial intelligence that is put to work in order to persuade people to click on ads, to make people buy an extra pair of shoes, watch another video, watch a next episode of your favorite Netflix show, and so on. And the same knowledge can be put to use to our education system in order to persuade people to watch just another video, or to make an extra exercise, or to show them the optimal next step in order to build their knowledge in a good way. So using these three ingredients, very small knowledge components, relationships between these knowledge components, and artificial intelligence in order to guide people through this knowledge graph, it's actually all we need in order to personalize education and tailor it to the individual needs of students. So with this idea, uh, there was a lot of work went, that, that went into this idea, and I didn't do it on my own. There were many people involved in the thinking process and giving feedback. And one particular person on the right, top right corner of the picture, Jonas, uh, uh, he was involved from the first day. Also a teacher, frustrated about the same things, and we decided, let's bundle our frustration and put it in something productive. So we decided to set up Lear Levels. Lear Levels is a um, social enterprise, and we want to bring artificial intelligence to education and use it to improve the quality of education. With this idea, there came, came some awards. In 2017, I was the uh, lecturer of the year of the Amsterdam University of Applied Science. In 2018, I was lecturer of the year, national lecturer of the year of higher education. Uh, and it came with a little bit of fame and a little bit of money. And it was a good start. It was a good start, but it wasn't enough. Winning a award is not, is not the end of it. 
It was not enough because uh, in our work, we uh, programmed a first prototype ourselves. We have some programming knowledge, and we decided to make a prototype and see how this artificial intelligence can be used for our education. And later on, we were when we started uh, involving other teachers, we noticed that this prototype is not scalable. It was a little bit hacky, something we built in our free time. So we decided to use this money that came from the awards uh, to hire professional programmers and make it more scalable, make it more stable, make it more safe in order to, to make sure that the data of the students and the teachers is safely stored and so on. And with the help of, of these programmers, we developed an app. It looks like this. So what you see is what a student would see. Uh, they see a part of this map or the knowledge graph, and they can immediately see what did they master or what did they not. And they can also see the relationship between the different knowledge components. And it makes them understand, why should I learn a certain topic? Well, you, need to learn, you should, should learn a certain topic because you need it for the next step. And it makes it more tangible for them. So what you see here is uh, putting this uh, app to use. So we piloted the app in different uh, locations. At a high school where Jonas is working, this, these are his students working in class and doing their homework. And if they don't understand something, they go to the app. These are students of the uh, Amsterdam University of Applied Science. These are international students that came from abroad and just finished uh, a Dutch course. And they have to finish physics in order to be able uh, to, to start a, a study. And they have six weeks in order to master the whole high school physics curriculum. So I use this app in order to help them along and master this, this topic. So what, what we have done so far, besides developing the app and developing the algorithm and, and doing a little bit of, of prototyping uh, and testing, uh, we added a lot of physics Content. So there is this knowledge graph for high school physics or from year one to year six and all the tracks within uh, the high school curriculum. About 400 building blocks, 400 infographics to explain what is happening in these uh, building blocks. About 380 uh, videos and about approximately 1,200 questions in order to be able to test the knowledge and the progress of students. It was a good start, but we are not there yet. Because what we did is just one topic, and there are many, many topics that students should master. There's chemistry, there's history, there's economics, there's mathematics. And what is even more interesting is not just to look at these topics as separate ones, but to think about the relationships between the different topics. Because I believe that innovation starts where you, when you combine different fields, which initially seem to have nothing in common. And from this combination, new things emerge. So going back to my frustration, the little time I had in order to inspire my students and inspire myself, I believe that this combination of these three ingredients, so thinking about restructuring our curriculum in a little bit more intelligent way instead of thinking about linear paths, and with help of artificial intelligence, we can personalize education in such a way that students can learn on their own at home without having this frustration of waiting until the end of the semester and watching all the videos at once, because they have a little bit of guidance, it's a little bit personalized, it tailors the content to their own needs. So that, that I, as a teacher, would have time in my lectures in order to inspire my students, and also to have time myself in order to learn, in order to inspire myself, in order to think about creative ways of making abstract knowledge very tangible, in order to come up with creative working forums and exercises and projects, things that I really enjoy and like doing in education. And these are the things that makes a human unique. To be able to organize education in such a way that our human potential is really put to use. In, in the classroom where there is this human connection between me and my students, instead of being there just telling them what is already on the PowerPoint slides. That's what we need. So this is how artificial intelligence would help us put our potential in a good use, our potential as humans in order to inspire each other and use artificial intelligence in what it is what, what it's good at doing. And with the help of artificial intelligence, education becomes really about lighting a flame instead of building a barrel. And this is Something we really need in the future if you want to inspire the next generation to think creatively, to face the challenges we have, 
and to come up with solutions we didn't imagine before. Thank you.